So the delegates are joining. Shall we start? Yes. Yeah. yes sir. Okay. Good evening to one and all. I'm Ankita from Clanet the designated as session assistant for a seamless experience and Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used Digitech platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Clarnet is very proud to be a digital partner for this event organized by Society of Onco Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. And topic of today's session is Anesthesia for Breast Onco Surgery. So kindly allow us a minute of your valuable time to share a short PPT to introduce the Clarnet Thank you so much, everyone. And let's begin with today's session. And I would like to invite Dr. Punita, ma'am, for her talk. So over to you, ma'am. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the chairperson, Dr. Halpana, and all the esteemed members of SOPSI um, for giving me this opportunity to talk about anesthesia for breast oncology surgery. Uh, but before that, I would uh, you know, apologize for the delay because I was not able to share my PPT properly. So anesthesia for breast oncosurgery. Can we go to the next slide? So what to expect from this lecture? Some basic brief introduction about anesthesia, breast cancer. Uh, what are the procedures which are done uh, for the patients with breast cancer and the anesthesia implications, the role of regional anesthesia and analgesia. Next slide. So 80% of the uh, women or, uh, um, do come to us for some surgery uh, when they are diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. So the breast cancer is the commonest malignancy among women globally and in India from the fourth uh, position in 1990s, it has climbed up to the current first position and the trend is more towards the younger population now. So in 2020, the number of new cases in, 20, um, in India in both the sexes for all across all ages was 13.5 percentage. And WHO has predicted that the number of new cases in females in India would increase by another 1 lakh from 2020 to 2025. Next slide. So 80 percentage of the females would come for some surgical resection or some diagnostic procedure to uh, us um, if they are diagnosed with CA breast. So, um, the surgical resection is the mainstay of curative management pathway. A few diagnostic procedures are excision biopsy, lung excision, and node biopsy. The therapeutic procedures are simple mastectomy, breast conservation surgery, radical and modified radical mastectomy with axillary lymph node dissection or sentinel lymph node dissection, prophylactic mastectomy. They may come for reconstruction surgery either uh, along with the primary surgery or at a later date. Uh, it can be a single stage or multiple stage. They can have a prosthetic implant or for autologous uh, grafts, free flap or pedicle flap. Now, since the anesthesia for reconstruction surgeries have been covered extensively in the last session, and I would like to concentrate more on the anesthesia for primary breast onco surgeries. So they might come for palliative mastectomy also. Next slide. We should know some uh, the steps of these procedures so that we can plan uh, the analgesia accordingly uh, if a patient comes for any breast surgery. So why is it important to know about sentinel lymph node biopsy for an anesthesiologist? It is replacing the axillary lymph node biopsy and it is done by combining the radioisotope and also a dye is injected near the tumor just before the surgery. So uh, the dye, commonest dye used is methylene blue because it is cheaper, but it can interfere with pulse oximetry. The other dyes are isosulfan blue and patent blue 5. But the incidence of anaphylaxis is as high as 1% with this dye, and it has uh, been recommended not to use this dye for uh, uh, during the surgical procedure. Next slide. So what are the pre-op concerns? 
most of the breast uh, procedures are done as an elective procedure. The, the main aim is to decrease the anxiety of the patients, should do a proper history, go through all the investigations, uh, clinical exam. What happened? Her connection is lost or what? I don't know. Let me just check. Can you hear me? No, we can't. We, we, you, you, were, you were not there for some time. and Okay, go on. Now, can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah, okay. So the pre-op concerns would be uh, to decrease the anxiety, go through the history and all the investigations, clinical examination and assessment of the airway, optimization of the comorbidities, and assess the suitability of daycare procedures or if we are planning a regional anesthesia for the patient. So also look for the effects of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, radiotherapy, hormonal therapy, and uh, if needed, order appropriate investigations without causing undue delay in the management. Next slide. So what are the effects of neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Most of the primary breast cancer patients uh, would have received six to uh, three to six cycles of chemotherapy before coming to us. So the common agents given are cyclophosphamide and doxorumicin. The common side effect is myelosuppression, which can present as pancytopenia with anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. And this is expected to reverse by six weeks after chemotherapy. If it doesn't reverse, then we have to treat it before taking up the patient. And the cardiac toxicity caused by anthracyclines uh, can uh, present as cardiomyopathy or long QT. The high dose cyclophosphamide can cause pulmonary fibrosis and hemorrhagic myocarditis. The hormonal agents, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors can be continued during the perioperative period. So the immunotherapy um, like the stratezumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, is also cardiotoxic and it increases the risk of perioperative venous thromboembolism. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, looking into uh, the details of cardiotoxicity caused by this chemotherapeutic agents, it can be either type 1 or type 2. Type 1 is permanent. It is due to the high cumulative dose of the chemotherapeutic agent. It can cause cell death. And the risk factors associated are the pre-existing heart disease, extremes of age, the concomitant chest radiation. The protective strategies can be use an alternative drug like epirubicin, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and other cardioprotective agents. The type 2 um, cardiotoxicity is more reversible. It is non-cumulative. It causes cellular dysfunction. The risk factors associated are pre-existing uh, heart disease, low ejection fraction, higher age group, and concomitant anthracycline use. The protective strategy would be uh, to decrease the anthracycline burden and to increase the gap between two drugs. So we order a post-chemotherapy echocardiography and electrocardiography and compare it with the pre-chemotherapy echocardiogram and assess for relative or absolute change in the ejection fraction, contractility, and effusion. For high-risk patients, add cardiac biomarkers and brain naturalistic peptide with echocardiogram so as to uh, identify the early asymptomatic disease. Document other potential drugs that can cause with them abnormalities. Next slide. Coming to the radiotherapy induced uh, lung injury, the primary breast cancer patients uh, usually doesn't receive radio uh, radiation um, before the surgery. But when they present later with a recurrent disease or when they come for a reconstruction surgeries, then we have to look for the effects of radiation. So the acute effects of radiotherapy in the lung is um, um, radiation pneumonitis. It is usually presents within weeks. And the effects are the patient may present with dyspnea, non-productive cough, pleuritic chest pain, or low-grade fever. It can mimic a, like an exacerbation of underlying pulmonary disease. There are no radiological changes. Usually, they are treated with steroids, and the resolution is complete in acute radiation-induced lung injury. While the chronic injury is pulmonary fibrosis, it, the patient presents with progressive dyspnea due to the scarring, uh, scarring of the lung. It is uh, radiologically evident the PFT might pick up the restrictive lung disease. Only symptomat symptomatic relief is aimed and the steroid doesn't help in uh, chronic uh, radiation injury. The cardiac uh, effects of radiotherapy are in acute stage. It can cause pericarditis and myocarditis, while in the 
uh, chronic phase, uh, they can present with valvular heart disease, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, and conduction defects. While the chronic effects are much more commoner than the acute effects. And in thyroid, it can cause dysfunction. So it is better to do a thyroid function test before surgery um, if a patient presents after radiation. Next slide. So coming to the perioperative management, on the day before surgery, along with the fasting guidelines, the medication prescription, we have to uh, explain the anesthesia plan to the patient. If we are planning to secure an IV in the upper limb, it should be in the opposite side of, in the limb opposite to the side of the surgery. Uh, under standard monitors, the balanced general anesthesia would be the ideal technique. Uh, the maintenance can be uh, either inhalation based or intravenous based with or without regional analgesia. For shorter procedure, it is uh, better to use a supraglottic airway like the laryngeal mask airway unless it is contraindicated like in an obese patient or in a full with a patient with a reflex. Um, so coming to position, if the patient has to undergo axillary lymph node dis dissection, then it is uh, better to position the patient uh, uh, appropriately to avoid the brachial plexus injury. The temperature monitoring is recommended if the procedure extends beyond 30 minutes. Invasive hemodynamic monitoring is indicated um, if the procedure per se or the patient comorbidity demands it. Next slide. So looking into the couple of uh, publications where they have seen the pharyngolaryngeal morbidity of laryngeal mask airway versus endotracheal tube in patients undergoing mastectomy. So they have found the endotracheal tube increases the incidence of voice problems and sore throat, while LMA had increased incidence of dysphagia and odonophagia in these patients. However, LMA uh, provides a good profile with a more acceptable one. The next slide. Uh, similarly, the other study, which also looked into the pharyngolaryngeal discomfort after breast surgery, has said that LMA causes lower incidence of postoperative sore throat and hoarseness and improve the patient comfort after breast surgery. Next slide. So the anesthesia technique and the breast cancer evidence. So what is the evidence? So uh, the publication in 2019 was an RCT, which was uh, done uh, internationally in multiple centers where where they had included more than 2,000 patients. It uh, was done for more than 11 years in curative breast cancer uh, patients aging less than 85, uh, where they had um, compared regional anesthesia and analgesia like paravetrol block and propofol with the volatile anesthesia, fluorine and opioids. And they have found that there is no reduction in breast cancer recurrence uh, by using a regional anesthesia and analgesia technique. And the Severity of persistent incisional breast pain was unaffected by the anesthesia technique. Next slide. The propofol based total intravenous anesthesia did not prove survi improve survival compared to the desflurian anesthesia in breast cancer surgery. And this was also a recent study where we have found that TIVO also doesn't improve the survival. So we need a lot more studies to say with whether anesthesia has any influence over cancer recurrence in these patients. Next slide. So coming to the analgesics, the common analgesics which we use is paracetamol, intravenous paracetamol, intravenous NSID, and um, intravenous opioids in the perioperative period. The other drugs which have been uh, recently been um, studied ex uh, extensively are the ketamine, intravenous lignocaine, intravenous dexmedetomidin, and uh, magnesium, along with regional analgesia. So next slide. So I would like to present few papers where they have seen the effects of intravenous or um, adjuvant uh, ketamine, lignocaine, magnesium given in these plain blocks and what are other evidences available. So this is a meta-analysis which have uh, seen the effect of ketamine on acute and chronic pain in the patients undergoing breast surgery, where uh, they have included 13 RCTs and more than 1,000 patients, and they found that ketamine is a safe and effective multimodal analgesic when given both intravenously and when added to book waking in the paravertebral block. However, ketamine also showed long-term benefit by preventing post-operative depression and post-mastectomy pain syndrome. The uh, dose of ketamine given intravenously was 0.3 to 0.5 milligram per kg and in the uh, paravertebral block, they had used one milligram per kg. Next slide. 
So in our own center, we did an RCT on 180 patients who underwent modified radical mastectomy, where ketamine was given before induction 0.4 milligram per kg, followed by infusion of 1 milligram per kg per hour till the completion of axillary dissection versus morphine uh, 0.05 milligram per kg 20 minutes before induction. We found no difference in the acute pain incidence or the rescue analgesic requirement and the chronic pain uh, incidence. So ketamine can be safely used as an alternative to opioid in multimodal analgesia in patients undergoing breast uh, surgery. Next slide. Next, coming to the effect of intravenous lidocaine on chronic postoperative pain in breast cancer surgery patients. So this was again a randomized double blind study where uh, which was done on 82 patients and they found the incidence of chronic uh, postoperative pain and uh, uh, acute postoperative pain both decreased in the if we use intravenous lidocaine and the dose used was 1.5 milligram per kg before induction and 2 milligram per kg till the end of surgery. Next slide. Perioperative lidocaine also reduces the incidence of post mastectomy chronic pain and uh, where uh, this was found to be associated with decreased incidence of chronic post-surgical pain. However, the breast implant placement and radiotherapy were associated with increased incidence in this study. In this study, they had used the lignocaine infusion even in the perioperative uh, period. Next slide. Looking into the effect of dexmedetomidin when used as an adjuvant for patients undergoing breast cancer surgery, there is a meta-analysis which included 20, 12 uh, RCTs where dexmedetomidin was given parenterally along with GA in six trials, four in the paravertebral block and two in the PEX block. It delays the time of first rescue analgesic, it decreases the consumption of opioid and also the postoperative nausea of vomiting, especially when supplemented with GA than in the regional blocks. And when used in the dose less than 0.5 microgram per kg, they also reduce the risk of hypotension. Next slide. So looking at the effects of magnesium sulfate, uh, when combined with ketamine infusion, it was found to decrease the intraoperative and postoperative analgesia, and they had decreased the uh, uh, opioid uh, rescue uh, dose also in these patients. It was more found to be safe also. Next slide. So effectiveness of adding magnesium sulfate to good in ultrasound guided serratus anterior plane block in patients undergoing modified mastectomy. Again, magnesium sulfate when added to these plane block has found to prolong the analgesia postoperatively without any significant change in the hemodynamic instability or total dose of rescue analgesic required. Next slide. So coming to regional anesthesia. So decrease in the incidence of chronic pain when using regional anesthesia was found incidentally while relating the use of regional anesthesia to the reduction of cancer recurrence. So what are the various approaches uh, used um, to give the plain blocks in uh, breast surgery? That can be an anterior approach or posterior approach. So the anterior approach, the procedures done are local infiltration, the pec block, the serratus anterior plain block and the parasternal plain blocks. Uh, through posterior approach, the thoracic epidural, paravertebral block, erectile spiny plant block, retrolaminar block, and rhomboid intercostal block are the uh, procedures done. So ultrasound guided facial plane blocks of the chest wall are alternatives to established techniques such as thoracic epidural or paravertebral block, and they are simple to perform and also safe. Next slide. So thoracic epidural, it is a safe alternative to general anesthesia. It provides bilateral blockade. It's generally administered in between fifth and in sixth intercostal uh, intervertebral space, and it blocks two to eight segments. It can be given at multiple places, or a catheter can be placed um, through a single puncture. The complications of epidural uh, thoracic epidural are hypotension, pneumothorax, spinal cord injury, or vascular injury. But the primary failure rate has been found to be as high as 23 percentage. Next slide. Coming to paravertebral block, it is unilateral. It is placed at T4, T5 interspace. It covers five to six dermatomes. Uh, the complications are accidental epidural spread, Hunter syndrome, intravascular spread, pneumothorax, and failure rate can be as high as 15% in those also. Next slide. So coming to the plain blocks, how do they act? They block the conduction of sensory afferents traveling in the targeted 
facial plane as well as the peripheral nociceptors in the surrounding tissue. The systemic action of absorbed local anesthetic is possible, but it is unlikely to be a major contributor. Uh, can you click? Next slide. Okay, so this is the ventral ramus where we see the peg block and the serratus anterior plane block acts. And next, next, next slide. So uh, this is where the posterior plane block, such as the erector spinae plane block, blocks where it um, blocks both the dorsal ramus as well as the ventral ramus. Next slide. So we need to know the neural innervation of the chest wall as well as the muscles of the pectoral region to um, um, give an efficient uh, regional analgesia to these patients. So the anterior chest wall and the axilla are mainly supplied by neuraxis, brachial plexus and the cervical plexus. So the anterior cutaneous nerve and the lateral cutaneous nerve of T2 to T6 thoracic intercostal nerves. The intercostal brachial nerve in the is the lateral cutaneous nerve of T2 mostly and occasionally also T3. So if we need to um, block the um, axilla or the medial side of the arm, then we need to address the intercostal brachial nerve which arises from these two. The medial pectoral and the lateral pectoral nerves of the brachial plexus, the long thoracic nerve and thoracodorsal nerve also from brachial plexus and the supraclavicular nerve from the cervical plexus. Next slide. So this is a, a, a thoracic intercostal nerve and it has been depicted uh, how it goes, how it uh, gives the lateral cutaneous nerve at the lateral, at the mid-axillary line and it goes to the uh, front of the chest and in the parasternal region, it gives off the anterior cutaneous nerve. Next slide. So when we uh, give a block below the pectoralis major muscle, we are blocking the anterior division of the lateral cutaneous branch. And next, next. Okay, so when we give below the latissimus dorsi and above the serratus anterior, again, we are blocking the lateral cutaneous nerve, the posterior branch. Next slide. So the anterior uh, cutaneous nerve is blocked when we give a parasternal block. Next slide. So a few tips about plane blocks. Anterior plane blocks, give it before the skin incision because the entry of air into the plane will make it difficult post-procedure. The posterior plane blocks can be given even before or at the end of the procedure. So it is not useful in reconstructive surgeries if the patient present at a later stage because the plane and, uh, is lost. It is vital to calculate the toxic dose as the volume is the uh, volume of the drug is the key factor which decides the success of the plane blocks. Next slide. Coming to the anterior plane blocks of the chest wall. This is the take one block which was described in 2011 or 2013 by Blanco. So this is given in between the pectoralis major muscle and the minor muscle in the anterior axillary, uh, in the mid clavicular line at the level of the third rib. It blocks the lateral and the medial pectoral nerve. It gives only myofascial anesthesia, no cutaneous anesthesia. It reduces the proprioception pain from the muscle stretching and the volume recommended is 0.2 ml per kg. Next slide. The PEC2 block is a combination of interpectoral block and the subpectoral injection that additionally targets the lateral cutaneous nerves of the intercostal nerves, T2 to T6, long thoracic nerve and the thoracodorsal nerve. So uh, this, we uh, go below the pectoralis minor in the anterior um, axillary line at the level of the fourth rib and the local anesthetic is injected between the pectoralis minor and the serratus anterior muscle. The volume recommended is 0.4 ml per kg. Next slide. Coming to the serratus anterior plane block, this can be given either in the supine position or in the lateral position. So the um, probe is kept at the mid axillary line with the arm abducted. So the superficial serratus anterior plane block, the drug is injected between the latissimus dorsi and the serratus anterior. However, in the deep serratus anterior plane block, the drug is injected between the serratus anterior and the fifth or the sixth rib. So this is the, this picture depicts the sensory um, block of the serratus anterior block. Next slide. So there are a few meta-analysis which are available um, comparing the PEG block uh, with the parenteral anesthesia or paravertebral block 
in the modified radical mastectomy group of patients. So overall, PEX block significantly reduces the 24-hour postoperative opioid consumption. The PEX block or the serratus anterior plane block produced similar analgesic outcome compared with that of the golden standard thoracic paravertebral block. And the PEX2 block is non-inferior to thoracic paravertebral block. Next slide. So uh, coming to the parasternal blocks. So why do we need parasternal blocks? The, uh, we can see from the image that the PEC2 and the serratus anterior supplies in the anterolateral part of it. However, there is a midline sparing which is supplied by the anterior cutaneous nerve, which are the branches of intercostal nerve. However, uh, these are not blocked by the PEC block and the serratus anterior plane block. So the types of parasternal block are pecto intercostal plane block where the drug is deposited in between the pectoralis major muscle and the internal intercostal muscle. In the transverse thoracic muscle plane block, the drug is deposited in between the internal intercostal muscle and the transverse thoracic muscle. The volume recommended is 0.2 ml per kg again. Uh, if any uh, dissection involves the internal mammary region, then it is better to give these parasternal blocks to block these uh, anterocutaneous nerve. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, how the transverse thoracic muscle plane block is given, where you can see that the probe is kept in the parasternal region between the fourth and the fifth rib. And uh, we can identify the internal intercostal muscle, uh, and below that, there is pleura, and above that is the transverse thoracic uh, muscle. So, the drug is uh, generally given below the internal intercostal and the transverse thoracic muscle. Next slide. Coming to the posterior plane block, which is the erector spinal plane block. This is the most uh, commonly done uh, posterior plane block and it has been extensively studied. So this is generally given at the third or the fourth vertebral level for a breast surgery. So the drug is deposited in between the erector spinae muscle and the transverse process of the vertebra. So it generally extends from cranium to sacrum. I mean, the entire plane extends from uh, like that. If you leave a catheter and depending upon the volume injected, the extent of analgesia will be accordingly uh, seen. Uh, however, it doesn't block the lateral cutaneous nerve effectively because the plane is restricted by the attachment of erector spinae muscle to the ribs on the lateral side and by the thoracolumbar fascia on the uh, medial side. However, it can seep in through the paravertebral space and it causes additional sympathetic blockade along with the uh, ventral ramate blockade. Next slide. So the erector spinae plane block has been found to decrease the pain and opioid consumption in breast surgery. Next slide. When comparing it with the PEC2, PEC2 uh, and ESP at the T4 level in all modified radical mastectomy patients, even though the intraoperative opioid dose and hemodynamic parameters were quite similar, it is found that the PEC2 resulted in a superior post-operative analgesic outcome, and that is due to the co better coverage of axilla and the T2 dermatome. Next slide. So what are the other posterior plane blocks? Retrolaminar block and rhomboid intercostal block. Retrolaminar block is least studied. Uh, the local anesthetic is injected into the facial plane between the posterior surface of the thoracic lamina and the paraspinal muscles. However, in the rhomboid intercostal block, uh, the injection is uh, given in the plane between the rhomboid and intercostal muscles. This provides anesthesia between T2 to T7 uh, dermatome. It is given in the auscultation triangle. Again, the recent modification of this block is it, is, it can be given in the uh, other area, but in the same plane, which is renamed as rhomboid intercostal subserratus plane block, where it affects T2 to T11 dermatomes. However, the effect or the usage of this block in the breast surgery is said to be uh, documented. Next slide. So what are the contraindications of plain block? Absolute contraindications are local anesthetic allergy or the risk of local anesthetic uh, block, local anesthetic toxicity if uh, regional anesthesia is provided in some other place also. Or there is localized infection at the site where you want to do it. 
relative contraindication is inadequate assessment by the sonoanatomy. So always we do a scout scan and see the planes and then decide to proceed with the uh, plane blocks or not. However, we have to note that therapeutic anticoagulation is not a contraindication to PEX or serratus anterior plane block. Next slide. Complications of plane block, it can lead to hematoma, intravascular injection, local anesthetic systemic toxicity, infection, pneumothorax, and temporary winging of scapula if long thoracic nerve is anesthetized with subsequent motor block of the serratus anterior muscle. Next slide. So this is a concise depiction of uh, all the procedures done and the blocks and the nerves that has to be addressed. Uh, published by the Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine in 2017. Um, for example, if you want to do a modified radical mastectomy, uh, it tells you what all nerves we have to be blocked, what all nerves have to be addressed, and what all uh, cutaneous branches that are need to be addressed. And suppose we add the axillary lymph node dis dissection to it, then again, the, the picture gives you a fair idea what all should be blocked and how does it help us. Okay, next slide. So prospect guidelines for oncological breast surgery, this, they have given overall recommendation for pain management in patients undergoing oncological breast surgery. So in a minor breast surgery, during the preoperative and intraoperative intervention, the grade A recommendation would be conventional NSID, gabapentin, local anesthetic wood infiltration. Well, the grade B recommendations are paracetamol and dexamethasone. In the post-operative, for the post-operative interventions, again, conventional NSID has grade A recommendation, paracetamol and opioids as rescue comes under grade B recommendation. For a major breast surgery, uh, NSID, gamma pentin, paravertebral block, and if paravertebral is contraindicated, PEX block uh, have the grade A recommendation along with local anesthetic wound infiltration. Paracetamol, dexamethasone have grade B recommendation. For the post-operative intervention, Again, NSAID has grade A recommendation, paracetamol, opioids, continuous paravertebral block, if catheter is in place, has grade B recommendation. What are the analgesic intervention that are not recommended for pain management in patients undergoing oncological breast surgery? So intraoperative interventions like retrolaminar block, rectospinal plane block, perineural agents such as opioids, um, adrenergic agonists, alpha-2, like clonidin, dexmeritomidin, catecholamines, NMDA antagonists like ketamine, or not recommended. So the reason for not recommendation is limited procedure specific evidence. In the post-operative period, again, the transverse thoracic muscle plane block is not recommended. Next slide. Coming to the post-operative management. These patients are generally nursed in the post-operative ward. We have to mobilize the patients early, patient specific pain control, which is multimodal along with NSAD, paracetamol, opioid, plus or minus regional analgesia. So the guideline says to avoid ipsilateral arm cannulation in the post-operative period, but there is no evidence for it. Next slide. So ERAS in breast surgery, there is uh, the society have recommendations for um, optimal perioperative care in breast reconstruction, which are being, uh, I think has been followed. Since we are not covering the reconstruction, I didn't go into the details of it. Next slide. So what is this um, home recovery after mastectomy? The American Society of Breast Surgeons Working Group has come up with this uh, newer concept where uh, the expanded use of enhanced recovery after surgery and the reason COVID pandemic has uh, led to increased number of patients who undergo home recovery after mastectomy. And they have uh, found after reviewing the literature that HRAM is a safe option in appropriate patients. So uh, preoperative education regarding pain management, brain care, and aftercare access to medical care are the crucial component for successful program, successfully implementing this home recovery after mastectomy. Next slide. So coming to the chronic post-surgical pain, of which post-mastectomy pain syndrome is one of the commonest causes. And the incidence of it can vary anywhere between 10 to 50 percentage. So in 2017, Meritoja et al. has found some clinical predictor mod prediction model, and he has developed a tool for assessing the risk of persistent pain after breast cancer surgery using the factors such as pre-op pain in the operative site, higher BMI, axillary lymph node dissection, 
and the pain score on the seventh post-operative day. So this is an online tool and it has been validated into uh, Danish population and one more uh, European population. However, this tool cannot be used in the pre-operative period because we need the pain score on the seventh post-operative day. Next slide. In 2020, the American Society of Breast Surgeons have identified factors that are associated with greater acute post-operative pain and chronic post-surgical pain. So the patient factors which can um, be associated with acute post-operative pain or younger age, higher pre-operative pain, pre-op anxiety, depression, pre-op expectations, and the surgical factors are bilateral procedures and prophylactic mastectomy. So the factors associated with persistent post-surgical pain or younger age, moderate to severe pre-operative pain, severe acute post-operative pain, and catastrophe. Surgical factors are adjuvant radiation therapy, axillary lymph node dissection, and preservation of intercostal brachial nerve. Next slide. So, and they have depicted a preoperative counseling and continuum of surgical care and multimodal analysis and postoperative uh, instruction. Um, so based on this, they have recommended the preoperative counseling by identifying patients with high pain risk appropriate preoperative opioid and non-opioid uh, prescription, prescribing, setting expectation around pain and multimodal rehabilitation. During the day of surgery, multimodal analgesia is ensured by pre-op medication, integrative method, interoperative, interoperative adjuncts, such as regional block, parental medication, local analgesia, and post-operative pain control. In the post-operative period, again, patient-specific multimodal pain control, activity instructions, and post-operative appointment. So uh, these are the uh, recommendations given by the American Society of Breast Surgeons to decrease the um, chronic post-surgical pain in these uh, subsector of patients. Next slide. So these are my references. Next slide. Thank you. So, um, so we can have uh, two uh, case scenarios so that we can apply whatever we have read about the uh, plain blocks or the utility of the plain blocks in these patients. So 75-year-old female diabetic with a BMI of more than 45 coming for excision biopsy of breast. So how do we proceed from here? Next. So we, we take a history. Next. Airway examination, clinical examination. Next. The history has to be taken from the attenders also. We do a stop bank scoring next. If needed, if the score is more, then we do uh, ask for a sleep study. But for a uh, excision biopsy, depending upon the clinical uh, examination findings, we would uh, either ask for it or we can just go ahead um, because it's a minor procedure. Next. Room air ABG. Next. If the uh, room air ABG, the PACO2 is high, more than 50, then maybe a pre-op uh, CPAP map may help this patient. Next. So how do we anesthetize this patient? So the choice would be to give a vigilant anesthesia. But before that, we have to counsel the patient. We have to do a scout scanning. If we are planning to give a um, plain block and then depending on the finding, then we either go ahead with that or we may we can plan a um, paravertebral block if that is difficult. Next slide. So the second scenario would be a 50-year-old male with CA breast who's a CAP, CO, with a history of COPD, smoker, is unable to lie supine. Next slide. Next. So you do a history. Next. Go through the investigations. Next. Next. Okay, clinical examination, airway examination. Chest X-ray, uh, the saturation in the supine, if possible, or in the sitting posture, room air ABG. Next. So what would be the, uh, optimize the lung preoperatively if possible, if you can do a PFT, if uh, the patient is able to do it. The next, the anesthetic plan would be to go ahead with a plain block. Yes, ma'am, I have come to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Punita, for uh, going into so much detail about <clears throat> all your, uh, the different types of uh, breast surgeries, the type of anesthesia, the different uh, 
blocks that you are likely to give and <clears throat> the present uh, evidence for the uh, uh, cause of whether the you know the regional anesthesia has any say at all in uh, in the outcomes in breast surgery so you went and touched on all those points <clears throat> i want to ask you something in all these uh, if anybody has any questions please put it in the chat box <clears throat> If uh, uh, you know all these, uh, like this man of uh, PFT is very uh, not good, and somebody with a COPD, uh, you said you're going to give a block. Now, are you just going to put them and give a block, or how does it go about? Uh, is, is it going to be totally awake, or is, is any sedation included? Uh, yes, ma'am. We have to optimize this patient. Like I said, we have to go with the lung pre optimization. You explain the patient everything, you get ready with the OT. Uh, like how we do for any other uh, case with all the essential uh, emergency drugs also. You also explain the patient that he will be awake because he has difficulty in lying down supine. So um, we tell them that, you know, with a slight uh, header, he may, we may be able to give the plain blocks if possible. And then we can sedate him like mod mild sedation, not a moderate sedation, mild sedation with some intravenous agent like dexmedetomidin if possible. So they will be awake. The idea is to keep them awake and then give the plain block and try to do the procedure. So there is one question by Dr. Raki Khemka who, who asks, do you use GABA pentinoids in breast cancer surgery in your institution routinely? No, uh, we don't use as such. However, if the patient has uh, pre-operative uh, you know, neuropathic pain, they might be on GABA pentinoids. But as a routine, we don't start them. Okay. Uh, Dr. Vibhavari congratulates you, but she wants, also wants to know whether, um, what is your protocol for IV access in bilateral breast surgery is, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, plan. Okay, we, um, thank you, ma'am. But uh, we generally try to gain an IV access if possible in the lower limb and if it is comfortable for the patient or else we try to locate uh, through the eject, uh, external jugular vein, or sometimes we uh, do a, a central venous, gain a central venous axis also if it is difficult. Because we assume that these patients would be started on oral the next day, and uh, you know, uh, so the uh, IV axis is not essential for a long duration. So then we go with the peripheral axis itself. Yeah, uh, the other thing is, well, don't we often, you know, go for the saphenous? At least I do. When that's I what I said, ma'am, in the lower limb. That's yeah. what I said. We need to change yeah. access in the lower limb. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, in the neck. Okay. Uh, Shreya Adhikari wants to know whether if, uh, if she has faced surgeon resistance and to peg blocks. I wonder whether uh, that is faced by others as well. I think, yes, by us, you can talk about it. What can we do to alleviate the surgeon's anxiety? So maybe we have to uh, you know, explain them saying that the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain is less when we give a PEC2 block. Now it has been uh, published and the evidence is there. Then we try to you know, convince them. Of course, yes, we also say in the same difficulty with our surgeons. They don't want it. They want to give uh, you know, at the end of surgery. Uh, they want to do it themselves. So we also face the same problem. Generally, they want to do it themselves. <clears throat> maybe you know that... Um, Anti-anxiety drug that was supposed to be given to the patient, maybe we should give it to the surgeon. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, any other questions? Uh, does anybody come across, you know, difficulty with um, uh, <clears throat> pulse oximeter not detecting? There, there are so many questions on the chat box. Some more are there? Yeah, there are so many questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you use IV lignogen in breast cancer surgery? No, I have not used, but I know there are uh, my colleagues who had tried using it uh, for few patients as may a part ask, of the model yeah yeah may i ask the opinion of the house regarding the use of only regional anesthesia in difficult airway cases it would be risky to convert it into ga if effect of regional anesthesia is incomplete so yeah um, yes ma'am you can go ahead <laughs> That is right. So you would assess certainly when it's the, when it's a difficult airway. I would be extremely wary to go without having the airway. That is a that is the thing to do in a difficult. We are first anesthetists. We want the airway okay. So if it's a difficult airway, I will 
try to secure a difficult, unless it's, you know, very small excision biopsy, which I know very confidently, even if none of my things work, the, you know, the surgeon can give some local and get away with it. That's fine. Otherwise, if it's a difficult airway, the first and foremost would be to, you know, uh, have some means of quickly getting the airway in. <clears throat> One other question is, is invasive blood pressure indicated in, in the given scenario? What is the given scenario? Yeah. Uh, in the first scenario, because it is only a lump excision, I don't think I would go ahead with it unless she is hemodynamically unstable or if her blood pressure is uh, varying or if she has diabetic neuropathy, then I don't think we would uh, really go in for invasive blood pressure monitoring. But for the other patient, again, I don't think there is a necessity for uh, blood pressure monitoring also. What do you say, ma? Not invasive monitoring. Blood pressure monitoring, yes, definitely, but yeah, not invasive, invasive yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, unless, you know, uh, the uh, pre-op ABG itself is very no, not good enough, that uh, you would rather have some uh, some way of uh, accessing a ABG intraoperatively if you need to, then yes, we'll probably place it, but may not, uh, you know, I'll probably place an arterial line, but not transduces, uh, transduce it unless it's really indicated. Uh, but to have it in the second patient with a uh, lung which is not so good would not be a bad idea. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Sohan, do you want to add anything? There's, no, there are a couple of more questions. Idea. So the, like some, sometimes we like, put artery, we can put art line if like if the patient is too fat or like BMI is very much where you do not have that enough uh, like uh, big cuff to measure the blood pressure or even your big cuff is not measuring the blood pressure well at the like in the arm or in the thigh or in the calf. In that case, sometimes we can just put arterial arterial line, but the indications are really very rare, especially in the breast cancer because we don't really because it's just a surface surgery. And then nothing going to happen. Uh, Generally, we also don't yeah. go in unless the lung is really, really bad. Yeah, yeah. One more question. Are blocks routinely used for all breast can breast surgeries or only when GA is deferred? Well, not as a routine, at least in our center. Now and then we, you know, as, as a <clears throat> somebody feels like it and then we'll do continuously yes. for five, then it will stop for some time. That's how it is. It comes in waves. I don't know about uh, the other centers. Mm -hmm. Do you routinely so blocks, do that? Blocks are not uh, routine anywhere in India, at least, I think. In the US, they put some serious anterior block in many breast surgery cases, but yeah, well, not uh, in India, nobody using it. Pack one, pack two problem is that we, we infuse some volume and the surgeon will see the like the local anesthetic coming out on the field, so that is also not good. That is why blocks are not, and I don't know, uh, I... <laughs> Because the patients are really going home tomorrow, next day, so there's not really a big issue of the pain in the uh, in the breast surgery. So I think it should be okay with the, even we go without blocks. Yeah, sometimes like I have done two three patients only in the only in epidural where the patient like <clears throat> the chest was really bad and the patient was really a uh, big contraindication for giving a, a GA and a, uh, intubation. So I did only my, like epidural and, and did two cases of breast surgery. So it's like. With the, but with the thoracic epidural, uh, with yeah. the impossible gone. Yeah, so. <laughs> sometimes I would think, you know, today's GA is so much more safer. Mm. Isn't it? With all the very short acting well, drugs. The, the patient was really, really bad because if you see the FEV, FEV1, the absolute value by around 0. 0.6 liter. Mm. And then uh, because if we, we don't want to like, Put the patient on the ventilator post operatively after bear surgery. So, I know I remember we did one uh, really morbidly obese means she was huge. Mm -hmm. We did one with the uh, tried with PEC, uh, PEC 1, PEC 2, mm -hmm. but then halfway through it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. the, the surgeon had to keep on giving more and more. At one point, we thought, I don't know what will happen, but somehow the case was done. But then we ended up, you know, putting her on CPAP and uh, keeping her for quite some time in the hospital. Well, uh, so uh. Now, now we have well, uh, many more questions. At least 10 more questions. Oh, okay. Our box routine, uh, uh, role yeah. of cervical epidural in anesthesia, I think that was just now answered. What is your opinion on TIVA versus volatile? Did you speak about it? I think you did. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah uh, TIVA, we have given for a few patients, I guess, TIVA versus volatile, but then there, it was generally... Uh, done to study uh, or look into the recurrence incidence 
uh, or is there any difference when we use a tiva and volatile some of we i in my op uh, in my experience i have seen the patients who are given tiva for very short uh, duration uh, are more sedated than the uh, patient who received uh, volatile uh, and and i don't uh, see any advantage of using tiva over volatile in such uh, short procedures uh, dr indra is asking in the facial plane blocks with catheters which would be better a continuous infusion or an intermittent bolus we give intermittent bolus in our center ma'am uh dr nivedya is asking can we use a bp cuff on the same side of the arm after breast surgery yes uh they say um, see the guidelines which was published somewhere in 2007 they say it can be uh, done uh, but not as a routine if you have no other uh, you know access in other limbs then it can be done but not for a longer duration um, there is no evidence it is all guidelines which have been laid in bilateral breast cases can we take radial arterial line if axillary lymph nodes are not operated on bilateral breast cases can we take i don't yes, understand the that question yes sir uh, what is the connection between axillary lymph node and radial artery line so sometimes when they do a breast case they don't want an intravenous line and uh, they do they don't say no to an arterial line if it is essential and if you have no other arteries to uh, no uh, cannulate but it has to be short lived like you cannot leave the arterial line cannulated for a longer time uh, but again as i said there is no evidence to say that these causes or leads on to lymphedema it depends on how much uh, axillary lymph node they have dissected and how is the interstitial fluid getting drained so there is no evidence for all these things you can use it but for a short duration Dr. Alok Kumar asks, uh, ESP blocks can be used in all major breast surgery. He says, "I thought the evidence as per your this thing, ESP is not as good, isn't it? Can you yes, read not as good as PEC two? It can be used, but they say it doesn't cover the lateral cutaneous uh, um, branch of the intercostal nerve, and it is not as good as PEC two in controlling the postoperative pain. Yes, it is effective for acute postoperative pain and uh, uh, to decrease the opioid consumption." this is i don't know it doesn't come should not come to the anesthetist i think what should be the safe time interval between completion of nact and planning of mrm okay. and the counts improve so, and the so medical oncologist says so, okay so, so normally uh, i can i can say the normally it around should be yeah. at least 3 weeks because they mostly they give 21st so, today we will have a normal uh, so, uh, the, the 3 week time should be yeah, because that you know, all the chemotherapy effect and that will take time to recover for at least for three weeks and about that that uh, i will line on the same side of the like surgery now there's some guidelines they are coming there we can even even we can take the iv line if needed yes so that there, 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 there is no evidence absolute contraindication of not putting the intravenous line on the same side of breast surgery so that's especially also. if you're doing a central node biopsy then the half the nodes are there anyway which are going to drain so it's fine uh, So the other question is: In both uh, PEC two block and serratus uh, plane block, we are blocking the intercostal nerve T two to T six. How are they different in pain management? Which one is more effective in LD flap? Okay, I think in LD flap, uh, the serratus anterior plane block would be a better. But to block the intercostal brachial nerve, which is the branch of T two or T three, it is found that the PEC two works better. Than the serratus anterior plane block. Of course, yes. When I, I had showed an image where uh, both PEC two and the serratus anterior plane block blocks the lateral cutaneous nerve, but it is given more anteriorly in the anterior axillary line, and this is given in the mid axillary line. So the plane is the same, but then the spread of the drug uh, is different, and they say PEC two is effective for axillary dissection. For LD, I guess serratus anterior plane block plane block would be effective. <coughs> The others can. Punita, I think that's all. Is the that's all other questions? I think. Yeah. So, uh, I thank Dr. Punita for a, a wonderful talk on breast surgery, and I also thank Dr. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, I I also thank Dr. Kalpana for a good discussion and like answer to uh, all the questions uh, in detail. so i think it was a good uh, show and we had around 68 participants today so
So thank you, Clemnet, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you ma'am. Thank, thank you, you so much, everyone. Hoping to meet you again on this platform very soon for the next sessions. So with all your permission, we'll conclude the session over here. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank Take you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.